Een betere wereld? Begint met het besef dat er nog een wereld te winnen is. Een wereld waarin gelijke kansen de normaalste zaak van de wereld zijn. Zonder voorsprong. Maar wie zijn wij om iets te zeggen als nog geen 30% van onze top vrouw is? Goed bezig zijn is niet goed genoeg. Ja, er is een hele wereld te winnen. En dat begint bij onszelf. Maar daarvoor hebben we mensen nodig die een verschil kunnen maken. Zoals jij. Begin bij ons. Say to people like, okay, that's great. I see what you're doing here. It's very tightly constrained and nice and pretty. But what happens when you need to scale? Well, suddenly when you need to scale your web server, you have two copies of your database. And clearly that's not a great situation to be in. Right. And so when we're thinking about planning to scale, what we say to people is like, hey, look, you need your web server and your database in different containers so that when you're going to scale out that web server, you don't end up with through two, three, four, five, a hundred copies of your database. You uh, end up with only a hundred copies of your web server. Right. And we do this. I think we've sort of intuitively developed an understanding of what it takes to plan to scale our software. Um, but interestingly, I don't think that we do a very good job of planning to scale our teams. Right. And so we think a lot about how do we scale our infrastructure, but we don't think at all, I would argue, about, you know, ahead of time about how we scale our teams. When we think about planning, when we think about scaling our teams, it's almost always in retrospect. It's almost always like, oh my gosh, suddenly we're not as agile as we used to be. What can we do about it? And that's obviously, I mean, even from, from anyone who's tried to, to fix a, a product that is no longer scaling at an engineering level, knows how hard it is to retrofit scalability into an architecture. And similarly, trying to retrofit scale into teams is also a very challenging thing to do. And so I think that even as we think about planning to scale our applications, we also need to think very hard about planning to scale our teams. So what does that look like? Well, I think one of the most important things that that looks like is defining boundaries. There's this poem in which there's a line that has always struck me and it says, good fences make good neighbors. And I think that the tr that's, it's a very true statement, right? If you understand where your responsibility ends and someone else's responsibility starts, you're gonna have a much better time getting along with people. And it's much more clear also whose fault it is, right? If you define a very clear API and you say, this is the SLA for my API, it's very clear. You don't have to fight about like, oh, this bug is caused by you, this bug is caused by me. Like, it's, it's clear, it's crystal clear whose fault it is. And, and so by making that clarity, driving that clarity, you actually are reducing the amount of friction, you're enabling teams to move faster. Um, you also really wanna decouple your teams, right? I think that this is really important that you know, we, we've seen situations where four or five, six teams all need to deploy their software at the same time in a specific order. It makes it very, very hard for the teams to operate. Um, you need to have every team be able to deploy everything, build everything, you know, run everything effectively entirely separated. That doesn't mean they don't connect to each other. It doesn't mean that the services don't talk to each other. Um, but version one of the software that team one has built should be compatible with versions one, two, and three of the software that team two has built, right? You have to, you can't have tight version mismatches. Uh, you can't have, you know, deep dependencies on data models and databases. You really can't have shared storage at all. Everything needs to be going through APIs. Um, and then I think it's incredibly important that we empower people and empower our teams, right? So one of the things that is tempting to do in a, an architecture that you're building is to say, okay, I'm in charge. I'm the architect that does all of this stuff and every decision has to come through me. Um, and that's obviously not a very scalable thing for teams at all. And I think many people have seen that sort of pathology. But one of the, th the whole points of the microservices approach in general, I think is to say, no, no, we're gonna empower our teams. If they define a contract, they say, this is my API, this is the SLA that I can deliver. At that point, we back off and we say, okay, we now know what you're supposed to be doing go do it. And, and I'm not going to check in on you. I'm not going to, you know, talk to you about when did you release what and whatever. I'm going to just trust that you can take care of your particular piece of responsibility. Um, in many ways, it's like the modular ways that cars are constructed these days, right? I don't, you know, I buy a fuel pump from here and a, you know, a, a spark plug from here. I don't actually take it apart and make sure it's made correctly. Um, I, I just put them together and, and trust that this contract has been fulfilled. But I think the challenge of this and this empowerment and decentralization and decoupling is that you have to have ground rules for these APIs too, though. 
you can't just go deprecating APIs willy nilly, right? So like there has to be a, a certain amount of stability in the API definitions. You have to have consistency around language and everything else like that. There's certain ground rules that you need to establish. So while it's tempting to say, hey, microservices mean we can all go party and we can write things in whatever language we feel like and use whatever languages we feel like, use whatever libraries we feel like, you know, use whatever authentication we feel like, it's very clear that there are some ground rules and some basic things that are necessary in order to ensure that there's consistency across the entire platform. I think one of the most important things here though is in this whole approach, I mentioned this earlier when I talked about storage, is that teams interact solely via APIs, right? There is no sort of like, oh, I stored that in that database over there, here's my connection string, you can go read it out of there. That is something that, that couples teams together and makes it very, very hard for them to behave independently and behave in an agile way. Uh, similarly, I think that you don't ask how the API is implemented, right? For two reasons. One is you're interfering in the empowerment of that team. But more importantly, the way that you take dependencies is by sort of getting into the private hidden implementation of the system and understanding like, oh, okay, well, the performance, you know, they didn't tell me that this was part of the contract, but I found out that I can do this particular thing. That's the way that systems get broken is by taking those sort of deep undocumented dependencies without actually uh, putting them into the public contract and into the public API. Um, a corollary to that is the notion of no back doors, which means even for you, you shouldn't be going into your database directly except for the thing that delivers the APIs, right? So like something like data storage, put an API layer on top of your data storage and then every single thing that you, even your team builds goes through your own APIs. Right? It's very tempting to be like, oh, okay, well, I have this public facing API for all of my consumers, but my, me, myself, I'm gonna skip around all that stuff and I'm gonna go through a back door. And what you don't realize is that by doing that, A, you're creating a hidden implementation that some other team may find out about and eventually use and you know mess up this decoupled system that we're trying to build. But B, you're skipping through, a, you're, you're effectively building two implementations. You're building a public implementation and a private implementation and making sure that those implementations stay in sync is actually quite difficult. And tons of reliability bugs that I've seen have arisen out of the fact that like, well, we tested the internal version and we didn't understand the impact that it was gonna have on the external thing that we were pushing out or sometimes vice versa. Um, I think that there is this other piece to this though that says, you know what, we actually do need to have some rules, right? And I think one of the greatest examples of this is some of the software projects I've been involved in. You have all of these little microservices out there and they make their own decisions about data storage format. And so you've got some configuration files in YAML, you've got some configuration files in JSON, you've got some configuration files in XML. It's a nightmare for people to deal with, right? So in some cases, while I said there's a ton of value and empowerment and autonomy, you're gonna just have to say, no, it's YAML. No, it's JSON. No, it's XML. Whatever it happens to be, everybody hues to this. You have to establish some core infrastructure, right? You have to have common API layers. If it's gRPC or HTTP or whatever it happens to be, you have to have common API and RPC infrastructure. This is something that is so critical because it sets the stage for things like common authentication, common certificate management, common rate limiting, all of the things that end up being very heterogeneous if you let your teams go and run their own way um, are, are, have to be centralized and it has to be done early. It's like adding unit tests. If you don't start out with a ton of unit tests at the beginning, it's very hard to retrofit unit tests. It's very hard to retrofit many of these things. Um, I would argue it's very important to standardize on a language or two. Um, you know, it's somewhat controversial in this polyglot world. I don't really care which languages you standardize on, but having 20 different teams using 20 different languages is a recipe for disaster because it makes common implementations very, very hard. There's some sidecar patterns that are arising to sort of deal with this a little bit, um, but I feel, still think standardization on a language is a good idea. Um, I mentioned earlier about unit testing, continuous testing and delivery is an absolute requirement for common infrastructure, even in this microservices world. You shouldn't all be building your own pipelines and all this sort of stuff. Have one team do it. It's very hard to do right. Um, and I mentioned earlier about authentication. Um, you know, obviously it's a really bad world if microservices each have their own notion of identity. They each have their own way of doing secret handling. These are all things that developers do a really bad job of um, and should be you know, centralized into something. So I think that in summation, there is this 
no, there, there is this interplay in, in, in the development of microservices and in the motivation towards microservices of both the needs of a large scale software project contrasting with the agility and, and efficiency and value of a small scale team. And the key to both motivating why you want microservices is to achieve that balance for your users, for your team, for your product. But also to keep in mind that while there are areas where you should have flexibility, freedom, and decoupling, there's also areas where it's critical that there's centralization, control, and a single implementation. And striking that balance ultimately is the key to implementing a microservices architecture correctly. Um, and I would say at the end of the day, it's also the key to scaling your team. And it, if you can scale your team and you can keep the, you know, the focus and the energy of the initial five person stage all the way through to the world where you have 10,000 people working on your project, um, that's the key to success and all of the other good stuff will follow, right? And independent agile teams with centralized core infrastructure is the way that uh, reliable yet agile yet large scale systems are delivered. Um, and with that, I am done. I'm not sure if, if there's time for me to take questions, but I would be happy to take questions if there are any. And thank you very much for listening and apologies for the, for the mic troubles. Hi, Ben, an awesome uh, keynote. Thank you so much. Well, um, there weren't much questions coming in. Um, but yeah, also apologies from our side about uh, technical issues. Also in the lobby stream, um, if you get back later, you might want to, um, to, to load the URL again. So you get the proper um, lobby stream where we'll give our uh, intro. Um, well, I still don't see any questions coming in while I'm talking. So cool. um, that means your, your keynote was very clear. And I guess so, I'm glad. Well, um, thank you again. Um, and if there are any questions at all, uh, I'm up on Twitter anytime or, uh, you know, have a great conference and thanks very much for having me. Een betere wereld begint met het besef dat er nog een wereld te winnen is. Een wereld waarin gelijke kansen de normaalste zaak van de wereld zijn. Zonder voorsprong. Waarin de innovatie van vandaag niet de zorg van morgen is. Een wereld die geen filter nodig heeft om schoon te zijn. En waarin geld schoon is zonder het wit te wassen. Maar wie zijn wij om iets te zeggen? Nog geen 30% van onze top is vrouw. Slechts 15% van onze hypotheken is duurzaam. Tiki blijft niet eeuwig nu. En we hebben witwassen nog steeds niet de wereld uitgeholpen. Goed bezig zijn is niet goed genoeg. Ja, er is een wereld te winnen. En dat begint bij onszelf. Maar daarvoor hebben we mensen nodig die een verschil kunnen maken. Zoals jij. Begin bij ons.